uh, welcome back. Uh, we have our fourth lecture at the Department of Pediatrics in CMC Vallo. Uh, this today's lecture is to be taken by Dr. Srinivasan Rathman. He is Assistant Professor in the Department of Development and Pediatrics in CMC Vallo. Uh, sir has more than 26 publications under him. He is currently working there uh, and also today's lecture by, by him will be on approach to Down syndrome cerebral palsy and ADHD. Uh, this lecture is mainly meant for the department, uh, for the medicine PG left, uh, students. Anyone who's interested, please welcome uh, all of you. Anyone who have doubts, please feel free to ask questions through the session, during the session, or maybe at the end of the session. You can put down the chat box also. Uh, this lecture will soon be uploaded at the Department of Medicine website, uh, YouTube website. So uh, thank you, sir, again for uh, accepting to take this lecture for us. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I welcome you all to today's lecture. Hope this is uh, useful to you. Um, uh, topics that were given were cerebral palsy, ADHD, and Down syndrome. But I thought I'll include autism also, being one of the most common neurodevelopmental disorders that we see in children. I've included autism too. So next slide. Uh, the outline of today's lecture will be, uh, it would be unfair to cover all these four conditions together in one class. So what I'd be presenting to you only is a bird's eye view or rather a satellite view of these disorders. And uh, we'd just be seeing the basics of clinical features. How do we establish the diagnosis and essentials of management of these four conditions? Now, uh, I'm sure many of you would be wondering why these topics and why me? And after seeing the uh, uh, title, many of you would be wondering, are we in the right class? We have all logged on to the correct link. And uh, this is just to help you pass the pediatrics questions in MD theory exam. That is one uh, objective. But uh, I have come with an ulterior motive. That is to sensitize uh, 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 general medicine PGs that these are not pediatric diseases because they affect the whole lifespan. And when we see such a child later on as an adult, how do we understand this? That is what is my ulterior motive of today's class. So going ahead first, uh, we'd be seeing cerebral palsy first. Cerebral palsy, as you know, is a disorder of movement and posture that appears during infancy and early childhood. It is a non-progressive disorder and it is, uh, uh, it is caused by damage to the developing brain that may occur before, during or shortly after birth. These are the components of definition of cerebral palsy. Disorder of movement and posture means it affects the motor milestones predominantly and there is abnormal posture of limbs that is often associated. And this disorder is non-progressive, meaning the children tend to improve with therapy or tend to improve with time and they don't regress at any point of time. And uh, the result, uh, it is a result of damage to the developing brain. Uh, a society for Cerebral Palsy of Europe classifies Cerebral Palsy into these three categories. One is the Spastic Cerebral Palsy, the Dyskinetic Cerebral Palsy and the Ataxic Cerebral Palsy. The Spastic can again be further divided into bilateral and unilateral. Bilateral Cerebral Palsy with predominant involvement of lower limbs is called as diplegia. Bilateral Cerebral Palsy with all the four limbs equally involved, we call it quadriplegia. And uh, dyskinetic cerebral palsy based on the predominant abnormal movements can further be classified as dystonic and choreothetoid. So these are the three classifications that we use now. That is spastic, dyskinetic and ataxic cerebral palsy. As we said, it can occur due to risk factors before, during or after birth, immediately after birth. Or it, the, there happens a damage to the developing brain. The cutoff we say is any damage to the brain within the first two years of life can potentially result in cerebral palsy. The prenatal risk factors most important being maternal malnutrition, severe pregnancy induced hypertension and a prematurity. These are important prenatal risk factors. Perinatal risk factors, the most common ones in India are hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, difficult labor, and abruptio placentae that can result in sudden hemorrhage and it can result in anoxia to the fetus. And postnatal CNS infections in any form, meningitis, meningoencephalitis, a vitamin K deficiency bleeding resulting in intracranial hemorrhage, uh, neonatal jaundice that is very severe causing damage and hypoglycemia. So these are some of the risk factors that can lead on to brain damage which can potentially result in cerebral palsy. Uh, spastic cerebral palsy, the subtype spastic cerebral palsy accounts for 70 to 80 percentage of all cerebral palsy. 
and world over prematurity is the most important risk factor which leads to cerebral palsy and in india it is still birth trauma birth asphyxia and birth related injuries that are the most common cause so uh, because uh, the world data outweighs far outweighs the data from india the most common subtype of cerebral palsy world over if you see it is spastic diplegia and in india it may be spastic quadriplegia or the total body involvement which is uh, equal to diplegia so as a group spastic cerebral palsy is the most common group hemiplegia accounts for 20% diplegia 50% and total body involvement or quadriplegia accounts for 30% and uh, common association hemiplegia can be associated with seizures and it is a result of a focal traumatic or a focal vascular lesion or an infectious lesion which can lead on to hemiplegia these children of are often called as congenital stroke or infantile strokes and diplegia diplegia as i said there is there is bilateral involvement but lower limbs are predominantly involved as compared to upper limb hand functions are relatively preserved in children with spastic diplegia and uh, usually these children have normal intelligence and epilepsy is quite rare because the region that is affected in spastic diplegia is the periventricular white matter and hence therefore epilepsy is rare they may have associated vision problems in the form of uh, cerebral visual impairment etiology for spastic diplegia as we said it is uh, prematurity and uh, total body involvement of quadriplegia can be associated with severe feeding problems and they are often associated with intractable seizures and they are caused by severe acute hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy an acute severe anoxic event will often result in total body involvement or a quadriplegic cerebral palsy and uh, clinical images as we can see here this child is uh, when seen when the child is uh, seated as you can see hand functions are quite good child is quite interactive but the moment you make the child stand or weight bear you can see there is scissoring of the lower limbs and uh, the, uh, there is scissoring of lower limbs and this child tends to weight bear on the toes uh, because of uh, tendooculus tightness this child has uh, calf hypertonia because of which this child whenever he is made to weight bear rather than bearing weight on the entire feet this child tends to weight bear on toes so the scissoring and equinus deformity are often seen in children with spastic diplegia and this is a child with spastic quadriplegic cp this is a typical attitude in the supine position you can see the upper limbs as well as the lower limbs being involved upper limbs are kept in a flex position elbow is also flex the wrist is also flex partially pronated and there is fisting the thumb is often kept closed within the palm there is fisting and lower limbs are kept in universal extension extension position and also there is ankle dorsiflexion so this is the attitude of a child with spastic cerebral palsy in a supine position and uh, as you can see the fisting is demonstrated here in the right hand of the child you can see the thumb is kept the, uh, tightly closed within the palm and you can notice scissoring and tendency to weight bear on the toes rather than on the feet and going ahead uh, dyskinetic cerebral palsy accounts for about 10 to 15% of all children with cerebral palsy most often results due to neonatal hyperbilirubinemia acute severe hypoxia can also affect the basal ganglia and can result in a dyskinetic cerebral palsy in these children we can see dystonia and choriform movements which uh, constitute to the dyskinesias that are present typically they are present whenever the child is active whenever the child is trying to move but they are absent when the child is calm or they are absent during sleep they are often associated with dysarthria drooling dysphagia and in children with neonatal jaundice it can also affect the hearing resulting in auditory neuropathy or sensory neural hearing loss again in dyskinetic cerebral palsy due to neonatal jaundice where basal ganglia is the only site that is typically involved the intelligence is often normal so what we have to see is a uh, 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 cerebral palsy does not equate to intellectual disability an ataxic cerebral palsy the least common form of cerebral palsy is often due to cerebellar lesions they are very rare and these children can be floppy during first two years of age often we think we equate spasticity to cerebral palsy but this subtype of cerebral palsy the children can be floppy during the first two years of uh, life and uh, in clinical practice we often see children with spasticity with some features of dyskinesia so it is the mixed cerebral palsy where features of two or more types of cerebral palsy that present together are more common so in clinical practice it is this mixed form of cerebral palsy where there will be bilateral involvement as well as dyskinesias that are commonly seen 
So to sum up, uh, this is spastic cerebral palsy, most common type. Sometimes there can be a mixture of spastic and dyskinesias, which is mixed cerebral palsy. We also saw the etiologies that can lead on to the individual subtypes of cerebral palsy. So this is a child where you can see typical dystonia. There is a twisting of neck to one side and abnormal posturing of the right upper limb and the right lower limb that is evident when the child is trying to move. So this is dystonic posturing of the limbs seen in a child with dyskinetic cerebral palsy. Again, another child with total body dystonia. This is a child who, has, who had had neonatal hyperbilirubinemia, a severe neonatal jaundice that has led on to this dyskinetic cerebral palsy. Child also had hearing impairment apart from this manifestation. You can see the dystonic posturing that is evident on clinical examination. So what are the associated problems in a child with cerebral palsy? 60% of these children can have associated intellectual impairment and global development delay. Motor impairment and uh, disorder of posture, that is a part of the diagnosis, but these are the associated comorbidities. The comorbidities can be intellectual disability, seizures, 50% of them will have seizures, and in children with total body involvement, a quadriplegia, it will be intractable. Seizures are also common in hemiplegic subtype of cerebral palsy. And vision problems in the form of non-paralytic squint, cerebral visual insufficiency can be seen in many children with cerebral palsy. Sensory neural hearing loss can be associated with 10%, especially common in dyskinetic cerebral palsy associated with jaundice. They can have associated feeding difficulties. Why so? Recurrent aspiration due to pseudobulbar palsy, oromotor muscle involvement, dystonia, dysarthria, all these can result in feeding difficulties. The oral phase of swallowing as well as the pharyngeal phase of swallowing can be affected. That can lead on to failure to thrive, recurrent pneumonias in these children. And most of them, if they're immobile, they, are, uh, they often have, do not participate in outdoor activities. So they're known to have osteopenia and fractures. This osteopenia can be compounded by the drugs that are used for epilepsy. Valprovate and phenytoin can also contribute to this osteopenia. Now, how do we diagnose cerebral palsy? Cerebral palsy is a clinical diagnosis. Uh, children often present with global developmental delay. Motor impairments with spasticity and brisk reflexes you see on clinical examination. And it is often good to correlate with an MRI. It is ideal in a situation where this is available, where it does not, uh, cost is not exorbitant, it can definitely be done. So ideally an MRI correlation with the clinical diagnosis is good. And uh, comorbidity specific investigations can be vision and hearing assessment. A hip x-ray is mandatory in a child with adductor hypertonia to look for hip dislocation. And in children with epilepsy, an EEG may be needed. Now, what, what did I mean when I say there should be an MRI correlation? There are specific patterns of brain injury that are associated with the subtype of cerebral palsy that we saw. For example, you see a child with spastic paraplegia or spastic diplegia. The child's MRI is likely to reveal periventricular leukomalacia and the risk factor could be hypoxia associated with prematurity. You see a child with severe spastic quadriplegia with pseudobulbar palsy with associated dyskinetic limb movements presenting like a mixed cerebral palsy. You should be seeing cystic encephalomalacia with thalamus and basal ganglia involvement. So if the pattern of brain injury is consistent with the risk factors that the child has gone through and the clinical phenotype also matches, then the diagnosis of cerebral palsy is almost certain. How do you manage these children? Often it needs a multidisciplinary team, a team of a physician or a pediatrician with an orthopedics and a neurologist may be there in the team, depending on the child's needs. And motor impairments are the most uh, significant aspect of uh, this child's problems. So physiotherapy for stretching and muscle strengthening. Sometimes these children may need braces and assistive devices for maintenance of posture and for correction of gait. Spasticity can be a significant problem and it can limit these children's activity. So spasticity can be uh, reduced by giving medications such as benzodiazepines and uh, muscle relaxants like uh, baclofen and tizanidine. And uh, often botulinum toxin, selectively injecting botulinum toxin into muscle fibers can help in control of spasticity and even dystonia. And uh, surgery, many of these children, as they grow older, they may have an abnormal posture and they may have an abnormal gait, which can result in activity limitation. An orthopedic surgery may be done in the form of tendon release procedures for assisting this posture and gait correction. Apart from this, uh, to help with their activities of daily living, to help, uh, help them improve in their hand skills, they may need occupational therapy. 
speech therapy for oromotor exercises which help in oromotor impairment and for child with intellectual disability a special educators help may be needed and feeding problems can be managed in the form of management of gastroesophageal reflux a gastrostomy tube feed may be needed in a child with recurrent aspiration so is prone for recurrent pneumonia these children you have to divert the pharynx and hence a gastrostomy tube feeding may be needed anti epileptics may be warranted for a child with epilepsy now i was uh, again i was emphasizing on why a correlation between the clinical and the mri picture is often necessary because of uh, there are some conditions which can mimic cerebral palsy when do you suspect cp mimics this is a child a 15 year old boy who was pres who presented with chronic kidney disease and a child had global development delay and short stature this child was misdiagnosed as cp and when a reference was given to us when we evaluated the child the child had associated oculomotor apraxia child also had associated nephronophthisis and it in fact turned out to be a child with jubert syndrome not all global development delay are cerebral palsy that is why a careful correlation between what has happened the perinatal brain injury and imaging is often mandatory when you should rethink a diagnosis of cerebral palsy when the child does not have any corroborative history suggestive of a brain injury or if the imaging findings does not correlate or when the child has progressive spasticity involvement of the bladder and bowel family history of an unexplained sibling death especially in a setting of consanguinity which is very common in south indian families and regression if you notice that the child is having regression of acquired milestones with minor illnesses or there are unexplained multi system involvement in the form of cardiomyopathy or a skin rash you should always suspect if this is a child with cerebral palsy or we should be looking for an underlying neurometabolic etiology so these are some conditions when you should suspect disorders other than cerebral palsy now with respect to uh, uh, medicine what what we should know an adult with cp what we should know about them uh, as we know because of better survival more children with cerebral palsy are becoming adult members of the society in fact diplegic and hemiplegic adults have near normal longevity and what is important to remember is the problems are quite similar the as to what they had as children the hearing and vision can tend to become worse with age and total body involved adults may continue to have refractory seizures they may suffer from drooling feeding issues and dental issues 9 to 10 percentage of adults with cerebral palsy are prone to develop hypertension and coronary artery disease they have uh, even ambulatory patients may have deterioration in walking with age and they have increased rates of fractures scoliosis with time and they may also have psychological problems like depression because of lack of participation lack of access to other things which are typically developing adult may have and some of them are non verbal and in them pain due to various etiologies like musculoskeletal gynecological dental or urinary and gi problems can manifest as problem behaviors so when such an individual when a adult with cp comes to casualty with a history of an unexplained problem behavior and if the person is non verbal we should always factor in could this be due to an uh, pain that is causing all this for example this is a child an 18 year old child who had a spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy followed with development pediatrics then later on grew up and lost to follow presented to casualty with a history of continuous cry and fever for 3 days child was seen in chitur and the child had continuous vomiting for the initial 5 days this child's pain was not picked up but in chitur gh this child's uh, tender abdomen was obvious and it turned out to be a child with appendicular abscess and other issues that are relevant to uh, adult with cerebral palsy can be dietary issues they may suffer from both undernutrition as well as obesity so going ahead the next condition that we'll be seeing is autism although this was not part of the topic that was given i'd like to uh, talk about autism because it is the most common neurodevelopmental disorder and many of you are parents and prospective parents so you should definitely know about what is autism autism is a disorder which affects the social communication that is a way a person communicates and relates to the people and the world around him that is autism and it is a spectrum why it is called a spectrum because the impairments can be a continuum of impairment not a, not a, all children with autism behave similarly and they don't have similar symptoms it can range from milder symptoms to severe symptom the symptoms can be noticeable by around 1 to 2 years of age and when the they when they join play school many of the features are quite obvious and it is often the teacher who picks up first that this child has unusual social interaction 
the incidence is more among boys than among girls so to help you understand features of autism in a simple manner i have made it into an acronym you must think of autism in a toddler if they have associated atypical features like avoiding or having poor eye contact using gestures infrequently that is non verbal communication also is poor talk late and talk less that is having speech delay the most common manifestation is speech delay isolating self from others meaning having unusual social interaction or not uh, uh, not uh, interested in socialization sharing of interest with parents and others are poor and movements peculiar repetitive body movements in the form of stereotypies so these are the most common clinical features of autism which we often notice so whenever a toddler with speech delay is there please look out for these features if uh, there is a risk for autism how do we make a diagnosis of autism it is a clinical diagnosis and it is based on behavioral observation what we have to show is autism is not speech delay uh, it is not that this child does not know how to talk it is because this child does not want to talk a communication intent itself may be less in these children so they may have deficits in reciprocal social communication they may have speech delay they may not have a normal back and forth conversation they may not respond to name calls they may have a, a lack of warm facial expressions and they may not even have non verbal communication like pointing or uh, nodding and they may have poor eye contact and they may not like to have a, a relationship with peers they may in fact be aloof not interested to playing with other kids they may not share their interests with parents they may not engage others in a play so these are the three basic criteria that should be satisfied to call a child as having autism apart from that the child should have two of the following that is restricted repetitive interest child should have stereotypic hand movements child should have restricted fixated interest meaning overly fixed only with cars child cannot talk about or child cannot imagine anything else than cars child will only like to play with blocks child will only like to play with wheels nothing else and these children may have sensory processing problems they may react uh, severely to even mundane sounds like a cooker whistle a child may not uh, withstand cooker whistle and he may run away from the place or shut their ears so i'm going to show you a video of two kids uh, one of them is a typically developing child and another one possibly has social communication needs please see the video so what do you observe one of the toddlers as as and when this child's name is called but the other child responds by turning back and smiling at them winking at them and when he finds an interesting toy he likes to share it with the others but uh, see this child the other child i want you to see the video again and see the other child now he is interested in the toy he is also present in the same place but he does not respond to whatever is happening around in his environment so this uh, this is an infant so what i am talking to you about is an infant both of them must be around 1 year of age so when you notice such abnormal social interaction even at 1 year of age you must be careful and evaluate and how do you manage children with autism any child who is younger than 3 years is a potential candidate for early intervention program so something can be done quite easily even before a definitive diagnosis can be made they can be started on intervention early effective intervention definitely helps in improvement of these children what do these children need intensive individualized multidisciplinary intervention what is multidisciplinary here they may need social skills training they may need communication training because socialization they don't have interest and communication is lacking because they don't socialize so they need both social skills training and also communication training it can be done through behavioral approaches or developmental approaches the name does not matter all you have to remember is they need social skills as well as communication training some of them as i said they may have sensory needs they may refuse to touch food they may refuse to walk on wet floor they may refuse to hear some noises or they may be extremely distressed by certain sounds so these children may need sensory integration therapy by an occupational therapist what are the medications that may be needed for a child with autism for comorbid conditions like aggression anxiety sleep problems hyperactivity these children may need as a, may, may need to be given some medications for control of these symptoms 
and uh, many of these children as they become adolescents in early adulthood they are to be encouraged into vocational training and rehabilitation and uh, pertaining to adults with autism what one must be wary of people with even high functioning autism they may feel significantly disadvantaged i don't know how many of you have seen a movie my name is khan my name is khan is an example of a person depicting a person with high functioning autism these persons may be significantly disadvantaged regarding employment social relationship physical and mental health they may suffer from depression they may suffer from anxiety and definitely it all have uh, has an impact on their quality of life so they may need lifelong support a psychological support may be warranted for them and many of them will have associated epilepsy for which they may need medication epilepsy intellectual disability may need medical follow up non verbal adults with autism again as i said like a non verbal adult with cerebral palsy uh, unexplained behavioral problem may be a marker for an underlying distress or pain again this is a, a case that we had seen a 20 year old boy with tuberous sclerosis with autism and epilepsy presented with severe agitation and aggression for 2 3 days child was previously well suddenly presented with this problem and uh, he was having sleep disturbances the child also had associated vomiting and refusal of feed and uh, he was uh, later on diagnosed to have pancreatitis an idiosyncratic reaction to valproate was diagnosed and this child's pain manifested as an acute behavioral deterioration so this is what we have to keep in mind when they don't communicate sometimes behavioral problem itself may be a mode of communication so the next condition that we are going to see is adhd often uh, often misdiagnosed it is uh, one of the most common behavioral disorders in school age children and uh, it is the it is suspected in many but diagnosed finally only in some and uh, because there are a lot of other conditions that can mimic adhd these children present with hyperactivity impulsivity and inattention the three cardinal features of adhd and it is a chronic condition and 60 to 80% of it persists into adulthood again like many other neurodevelopmental disorders it is common among boys than among girls the combined subtype of adhd is commoner among boys whereas inattentive subtype is common amongst girls how do we diagnose the clinical features what is the natural history of adhd not all of them seem hyperactive the hyperactive impulsive symptoms predominate only in the early childhood these symptoms start by around 4 years of age and they peak by 7 to 8 years of age and later on there is a decline in this hyperactivity impulsivity symptoms and by adolescent years they are hardly noticeable some of them these impulsive symptoms can persist throughout life it may not manifest as impulsivity but it can take the form of risk taking behaviors a tendency to try out new things substance abuse all those can be the features of impulsivity later on in life inattention symptoms persist lifelong and they are often observed only at around 8 9 years of age and in adolescence inattention manifests as academic difficulty so in adolescents and young adults who present with learning problems who present with peer relationship problems who present with substance abuse it is often uh, um, uh, it is often good to screen for associated adhd how do we diagnose again we have a diagnostic criteria you need not remember all this there are two subsets of symptoms one is hyperactivity impulsivity another is inattention in children we need six out of these nine and in inattention again we need six out of these nine for adults it is five out of nine examples for hyperactivity impulsivity is excessive fidgetiness not uh, willing to sit down in situations where child has to sit excessive talking interruption and intrusion of others that is hyperactivity impulsivity and in inattention easily getting distracted daydreaming failing to follow through instructions not paying attention to detail all these are some of the inattentive symptoms so uh, when uh, on superficially when you read this it seems that all of us may be having some of these symptoms but what is more important is the caveat the underlying rider is very important these should be severe and they should be out of proportion to child's age and developmental level and they should be persistent in all environments and there should be no appropriate alternative explanation only if this is satisfied we can take these uh, symptoms to be significant so symptoms should be persistent in all environment and they should be inappropriate to a child's development level that is why it is very difficult and it is often wrong to diagnose adhd in a young toddler because in a toddler 
it is uh, hyperactivity may be developmentally normal so it is very difficult to diagnose adhd in young children often it is a feature in school going age group where it is developmentally inappropriate the, the dsm5 requires all these symptoms should have begun before 12 years of age present in two or more settings and it should interfere with functioning if you have these symptoms and there is no problem with functioning we still don't label this child as having adhd there should be significant impairment in academic social or other activities so uh, as i said there are sorry uh, there are three subtypes of uh, adhd one is predominantly inattentive predominantly hyperactive impulsive when you have combination of these two features we label the subtype as combined and combined is commoner as a subgroup combined is more common in boys and how do we diagnose adhd it is based on behavioral observation we have validated parent and teacher rating scale i said it should be present in more than one setting so parent as well as teacher have to rate before you can label the child as having adhd so you give this behavior rating scales to be filled by parents and by teachers and then you deduce based on this you also do a behavioral observation of a child in person to see the child has hyperactivity impulsivity and inattention and then you diagnose adhd commonly used uh, scales that we use here are corners behavior rating scale and a child behavior checklist these are two commonly used behavior rating scales for diagnosis of adhd how, how do we manage adhd for young children children 4 uh, to 6 years of age again as i said diagnosis of adhd is highly uncommon in this age group but there can be some children who manifest in this age group if they have significant limitation of functioning you can diagnose in this age group if at all you have a young child with adhd medications are only second line behavioral intervention will be the first line of therapy how what is the behavioral intervention you do you advise parents to limit distraction break tasks into smaller step provide frequent breaks in between tasks promote hobbies promote physical activity for the child so that child has better attention when it comes to cognitive tasks so behavioral intervention is the first line of therapy for young children with adhd now for a child more than 6 years of age that is a typical school going age group and adolescents when you diagnose adhd stimulant drugs medications are the first line of therapy commonly used stimulants are uh, methylphenidate and uh, methylphenidate can be a short acting form or an extended release form so stimulant drugs form the first line of therapy for older children with adhd often behavioral interventions are given as an adjunct to these medication so young child behavioral intervention older children medication plus behavioral intervention form the basis of management now in medicine why should you know about adhd as i said 60 to 80% of them continue to have symptoms in adulthood inattention and impulsivity in varying forms may persist adhd sometimes is not recognized and diagnosed until the person is an adult because it may not have had significant impact on functioning significant impact on academics this child may not have had a diagnosis but as they become adults they struggle with their impulsiveness they may be restless they may have difficulty in paying attention that results in very poor organization of tasks they may find it difficult to focus and prioritize tasks they may miss deadlines they may have poor social skills they may have a tendency to make rash decisions all these are features of adults with adhd they may also resort to substance abuse and many of them may be depressed because they are not able to carry out their functions like an another typical adult so this all often may be seen in adulthood and when you diagnose adhd in adulthood they may also need medications with behavioral therapy and mindfulness therapy in some so going on the last part of uh, today's lecture is uh, down syndrome down syndrome is a straightforward diagnosis so it is a condition it is a genetic condition that can be recognized by an obvious gestalt so these children present with global development delay and uh, during first presentation you may often pick up the diagnosis by the typical dysmorphisms i'll be telling in telling you in brief about the typical dysmorphisms so down's phenotype it's called a down's phenotype what is it flat facial profile when look from the side the nose may be depressed there is a depressed nasal bridge a hypertelorism a wide gap between the both the eyes an epicanthic eye fold a fold of skin stretching from the upper eyelid to the uh, bridge of the nose 
hands may be short and broad and they may have associated single palmar crease which is called a simian crease they may have associated cardiac problems and posteriorly they will have a flat head a brachycephaly and they may have a low posterior hairline a short neck and a low set ears hands and feet as i said they may have brachydactyly short stubby fingers and a wide gap between the great toe and the second toe is commonly seen which is called as sandal gap as you can see here a wide gap between the uh, great toe and the second toe is seen and this is obvious to many of us the risk of down syndrome increases with maternal age for example the risk of down syndrome in a mother who is less than 25 years of age is 1 in 1600 whereas it increases to as high as 1 in 80 for a woman between 40 to 42 years of age associated problems in down syndrome uh, they may have uh, associated duodenal atresia annular pancreas which is it can be picked up even in the neonatal period all of them are prone for constipation and some of them develop celiac disease in their adulthood they may have associated cardiac problems immunity they are all prone for recurrent infection they may have problems with cell mediated as well as antibody mediated immunity so they are more prone for infection they are also more prone for autoimmune disorders they are also at risk of multiple hematological malignancies especially the acute myelogenous leukemia and they are at a lifelong risk of hypothyroidism uh, congenital hypothyroidism as well as acquired autoimmune forms of thyroiditis are common in fact autoimmune forms are very common so serial thyroid monitoring is very much essential for these children and they may have atlanto axial subluxation which can result in cervical cord compression at any point of time and they may develop myopia and hearing loss during fall out diagnosis is usually clinical again corroborated with the karyotyping trisomy 21 is the most common subtype of down syndrome translocation and mosaicism are the rarer variety so karyotyping may be needed in most of these children for diagnosis as in fact in all of these children for diagnosis how do you follow up these children as i said lifelong they may need some monitoring growth monitoring is mandatory if they have growth faltering watch for hypothyroidism and celiac disease watch for obesity in them they are prone for obesity and developmental monitoring and developmental stimulation activities are mandatory in early life could later on they may need vocational training and rehabilitation and uh, these children should have annual thyroid screen uh, definitely they may need uh, annual thyroid function test tsh and free t4 should be done and also screen for celiac and type 1 diabetes mellitus beyond adolescent age group ask for constipation during every visit and treat constipation aggressively annual vision and hearing evaluation is mandatory because they are prone for adenotonsillar hypertrophy and also they have a flat facies they are prone for middle ear effusions and conductive type of hearing loss and count serially monitor counts uh, carefully look for hematological malignancies uh, using appropriate clinical features and they are all prone for obstructive sleep apnea as i said before they may have adenotonsillar hypertrophy Un, uh, uh, unattended obstructive sleep apnea can lead on to pulmonary hypertension in adulthood in many of these children with down syndrome so carefully screen for obstructive sleep apnea and aggressively manage it at an earlier stage and uh, look for neurological examination to look for cord compression uh, to look for any atlanto axial dislocation now what should we know for uh, with respect to an adult with down syndrome as i said again with uh, like in other disorders the life expectancy of down syndrome has dramatically increased in 1930s it used to be around 9 years whereas now they live as long as the general population and one particular problem with down syndrome is they are prone for premature uh, aging and they may have early alzheimer's disease other common comorbidities that are of relevance are obesity and obstructive sleep apnea and related cardiac problems some of them can have mood and behavioral disorders which need continued follow up they are also prone for osteoporosis they are also prone for autoimmune diseases so they may need follow up for thyroiditis and celiac diseases and of course hematological malignancies a lifelong risk of acute myelogenous leukemia is well recognized in a child with down syndrome now finally uh, i would like to leave you with a, a food for thought what is in general our outlook about any disability Uh, whenever i ask my own pgs about their interest in developmental pediatrics uh, many of them have frankly said so what is treatable here why should i take this uh, subject so often uh, whenever we see disability we often see it with the as a medical model 
what is the difference between medical model and social model medical model views the disability as a disease or what the person suffers from and only the biological aspects of the uh, disease per se whereas the social model looks at disability as uh, in toto it also sees how social uh, how social factors environmental factors impacts the person's life in fact disability is a problem at the level of person's body and also a social phenomenon so i would like to place a plea amongst all of you to even change the terminology that we use the term uh, what is in the name uh, why what is wrong in calling it a disability i'll tell you uh, how 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 is functioning functioning also describes the same aspects of disability but it provides a positive connotation so the positive and negative aspects are represented by the terms functioning and disability respectively disability in stricter sense is not only due to the medical condition but also an interaction between the health condition and environmental and personal factors would you agree that a hearing impaired child born in a village where everyone else is hearing impaired is no more disabled yeah so disability is not only due to the medical condition but also the environmental and other factors the social factors also come into play so it is important for us to describe every individual in terms of the functions that he is able to do and not able to do rather than describing only the medical aspects of the disease that the person is having because when you describe function you identify the needs of the individuals when you identify the need that can be targeted by the intervention so to bring it uh, to bring all these into clinical practice the who has proposed the icf model what is an icf model it does not only look at the health condition that we used to see conventionally in the medical model of uh, managing diseases we also see what are the body functions and structures that are affected or restricted what are the activities that are restricted and what are the participation aspects this person is able to do not able to do what are the conducive or obstructive environmental and personal factors which can affect any of these three so body functions and structures activity participation and what factors promote or add, uh, 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 obstruct these things that is what we have to be looking when you start looking at this you set therapy goals so when you view neurodevelopmental disorders in a medical model we often see cure that is what patients come for can anything be done for autism is it curable that is the first question many of them ask because they are all attuned to this medical model of disease and we know that cure is not attainable in many of these neurodevelopmental disorders cerebral palsy cannot be cured uh, adhd cannot be cured autism cannot be cured but that does not mean we cannot do anything for these children that is why it is important to attune our parents and in fact attune our students and fellow doctors to this bio psychosocial model where you look at the person's functioning and try to look for functionally optimal outcomes because this person also can carry out certain functions this person also has an ability to participate in society activity and any person can be a fruitful member of his or her learning environment and any person must have fun and all these are attainable often that provides a meaning when you talk about therapy aspects to these people when you say there is no cure there is often a dejection but when you talk in terms of function parents understand better and it provides a positive connotation when it comes to therapy so i'd like to leave you with this quote the art of medicine is to cure sometimes relieve often and to comfort always that is the last aspect of which i wanted to highlight to you in today's topic thank you for your patience Thank you, sir. Uh, this is a very meaningful, relevant, simple, uh, simplified lecture on the approach. Any questions? Uh, so you mentioned that uh, in respect to CP uh, or in, uh, AD, um, yeah, CP or Down syndrome, we have a insult or we have an objective to start with where we know it's a definite uh, sequel of what happens. Yes. I mean, what all evolve might evolve into. Yes. Uh, but in the case of autism or in ADHD, is it like an all-in-all -all non phenomenon, or is it like a particular insulin dino over itself, or is it an evolving thing affected by the social and environmental factors also? Yeah. The present understanding of ADHD and autism is there is a it is a it is explained as a causal pie model. The causal pie is the most recent explanation for some of these neurodevelopmental disorders. Meaning, there are some genes which cause uh, a problem with the neural framework. 
they are neurodevelopmental problems studies uh, uh, studies using mri studies using functional imaging have shown problems in the brain uh, tractography studies have shown problems in tracks connections in the brain so they do have a neurodevelopmental basis the genes have a role in causing uh, autism and adhd but there are some as of yet unknown or as of yet unproven environmental triggers which can cause these genes to malfunction or which can impact further the effect of genes so it is uh, uh, in a simpler parlance to say it is like diabetes where there is a gene as well as an environmental insult to that which can modify the uh, expression of the gene so it is a causal pie model where genes as well as environment have an interplay the environmental as aspects are as of yet poorly understood there are well known factors like exposure of valproate to the fetus during pregnancy definitely has a higher risk of autism mm -hmm. uh exposure of certain teratogens uh, during pregnancy to a mother can definitely risk in higher risk of adhd all those but these environmental factors we don't uh, such a study is very difficult no exposure would have happened long back manifestations take many many years down the track so it is very difficult to prove associations it is very difficult it is easier to show association it is very difficult to prove causations when it come to environmental factors in that answer it any further questions lecture is only uploaded uh, thank you sir thanks again for that very much simplified and relevant topic nowadays thank you very much i i thank the department of medicine for uh, providing me with this opportunity thank you very much thank you sir thank you please wind up quickly